right, testing one, one. All right. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jonathan Picon. I'm one of the teachers here at Thunderbird Adventist Academy. I teach math and science, uh, but I'm not your traditional math and science teacher. Uh, went to school to be a chemist and then felt the Lord's calling to be a pastor. So what do chemists, a chemist pastor, what does, what does that kind of person do? Oh, they teach at a Christian school, I guess. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm doing now, um, and just excited for the opportunities that the Lord uh, provides. And it's an honor and privilege to share a message that has been near and dear to my heart. Um, and one of the things that I really, where, where this message really stemmed from was a conversation with a student. I love having conversations with students because they'll tell you, especially at the high school level, if, they, if you've gotten comfortable with them, they'll just tell you what's on their mind. And I remember I was just sitting in my classroom as, you know, as I do in the morning. I had a student come in and they said, you know, I've been thinking, we celebrate freedom in this country quite a bit. Now, I'm not a history teacher. I do love history. But I'm like, you don't say. Tell me more. I, I, love, I love, you know, following up questions with, well, tell me more. Tell me more. And they're like, well, you know, we celebrate Independence Day, obviously, here in this country. But we also celebrate other holidays surrounding the theme of freedom. And so, of course, I well, well, yeah, tell me more. Tell me more. Well, you know, just, we're, we're, this was in February, about a month ago. So, like, you know, we're, we're in the midst of February. We're celebrating Black History Month. Theme just overflowing with freedom because of the history of slavery in this country. And then they're like, well, Juneteenth is kind of attached to that, but, but, March is Women's History Month, and we celebrate the freedoms that women gained over the course of this nation's history. And so, instead of following up with, tell me more, the next question that I asked was, well, what is freedom? And what is freedom to you? And that question can have various answers depending on who you ask. For a teenager, the ability to get behind the wheel, not having a curfew anymore, right? That's freedom. For some of us adults, hopefully the weekend, right? That's freedom. For teachers like myself, not having anything to grade, right, Mrs. Campos? Getting a little break. We love you students, but getting a little break, not having to input grades. Sorry, Nico, I haven't input your grades yet. They're, they're coming after, after the break, I promise. But that's freedom. Well, what for the Christian, for the believer in Jesus Christ, what is freedom? That is a question that has, play, not plague necessarily, but has been constant in the mind of the believer. And I think it's a question that begs uh, reflecting on constantly, as constant as possible. And so today we will look at, well, what is freedom? We have two questions we'll be exploring. The first, well, what is freedom? What is freedom? And the second, the second being, how do we know then, having defined freedom, that we are in fact free? Before we uh, dive any further, I invite you to join me for a short, uh, a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather Lord, once again, I, I echo our previous prayer. There are many things on our hearts, on our minds. We ask that despite the, the distractions, despite the messenger, that you speak to us this morning. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I think the question, what is freedom, is quite possibly best asked, at least to begin the conversation, with someone who does not have it. They are the ones who pursue it most diligently. And so you ask or you look through history and you ask people, well, what is freedom? And they'll give you an answer. And again, depending on who you ask, the answer will be different. But as I searched, I found some things, some things that were quite interesting. The first was not just that Depending on who you ask, you get a different answer. But people that we sometimes classify as not free, 
seem to have a greater sense of freedom than those of us who say we are free. What am I talking about? Well, in research done in various um, prison institutions around the world, um, prisoners claim to be free. I don't know if you know this. One uh, prisoner from the UK states, all my life I have been lost or I've been so caught up in my own self-centeredness. It's like my whole life I've been in a prison. And now, now that I'm actually in prison, I feel so free. I'm so calm. I'm at ease with my life. I am at peace. Another prisoner, Meg Warden, states it this way. She says, freedom is one of those things that is so deeply attractive, but yet so deeply terrifying. Who would we be if we were truly free? Do we even know what it means to be free? I mostly remember of my time in prison that there only really is, there actually is real freedom. Real freedom is the ability to breathe, to surrender, to choose grace, kindness, and love. For after all, freedom is an option. So for us, to begin to search for that answer, what is freedom? The best place to start is right here. If we truly believe, if we truly claim to be followers of Jesus, our search for answers to some of these questions ought to begin right here. So let's dive into the words of Jesus. I invite you, if you have a Bible or a Bible-capable device, that you open your Bibles to John chapter 8. I will have uh, a few verses uh, up on the screen, mainly the ones that we will be highlighting. John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, we find Jesus, at the beginning of the chapter, he's encountered with a group of people letting him know, hey, this woman, she's been caught in adultery. And hopefully many of you remember how that story turned out. But he, Jesus transitions from that experience to begin to define for us what freedom is. Chapter 8, verse 31. And notice who he's speaking to. Verse 31 tells us, So Jesus said to the Jews, but not just any Jews, the Jews that had believed in Him, if you abide in My Word, you are truly My disciples. So Jesus is here at the temple talking to people who believe in the ministry that He is doing, and He says, hey, listen, if you are truly My disciples, you're going to abide in My Word. And he follows that up saying, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I want you to notice what Jesus is saying about freedom here. He's saying the key to freedom is truth. So the key to oppression is what? Our lies. Our lies. And we looked at that briefly, for those of us in Sabbath school, we looked at that briefly in the history of who we are. Oppression started with a lie. A lie that seemed a whole lot like truth. Eat of this fruit so that you may be like God. But truth, Jesus says, is the key to freedom. What has caused us to be oppressed are lies. And so freedom as a concept, really is one that is flawed because as human beings, we are flawed. So rather than thinking of freedom as a concept, we ought to think of freedom as a person. I heard one soul, amen. One person believes it. Why do I say that? Because the same man who said, the truth shall set you free, said the following, I am the way, the truth, and life itself. If, as believers, we continue to seek out freedom, we have lost everything that Jesus has been trying to tell us all along. Lies are what are oppressing us. 
I am the key to freedom. For in me there is not just life, but truth. If you want to be free, you need me, is what Jesus says. But notice that the the Jews here who he's talking to don't understand what he is saying. They, They follow this up by asking in verse 33, we are the offsprings of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it then that you say we need to be free? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. It's what we've talked about just now. The key to oppression are the lies that sin allows us, or that we allow sin to tell us and we believe. But rather truth is, And freedom not being just a concept, but being rather a person, an unflawed, perfect person, the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we could dive real deep into this, and this is not what the focus of today is. We could continue continue on, but I want you to notice what Jesus says after that, which is the key point of really the title of the message this morning. Once they tell him, we've never been enslaved, they had, Exodus, you remember the Exodus? Captivity, form of enslavement. They said, we're children of Abraham. We've never been enslaved. Jesus responds to that by saying, the one whom the Son sets free has freedom indeed. The freedom that Jesus provides is one that is definite. There's no question about it. When we see Jesus as the truth that breaks the chains of bondage that have been brought in our lives because of Adam and all the sinfulness up to our point in life, when we accept freedom as the person of Jesus, we are not just free, but Jesus says, you are free indeed. Freedom is definite when we accept it in the form of Jesus Christ. When we accept it as the ability to do whatever we want, it's a fake freedom. But when we accept it as the person of Jesus, it is definite. It is complete. And so Jesus says, if you accept me, you have freedom, and it's a freedom that can't be taken away. And so when we sing songs like the one that we sang this morning, there is power in the blood. The question that starts off that hymn, and I love these hymns because they're just rich in in, in theology. Would you be free of the power of sin? There's an answer to that question. There's a definitive answer that no one can take that away. It's the power of the blood. The person of Jesus is the key to our freedom. But that begs that second question that I I told you about. Also, because oftentimes we think we have something and we really don't. I'll give you an example. I'm not going to throw my wife under the bus. Um, I'm going to throw myself under the bus. How about that? Um, well, actually, she can see me. Can, can, I, can, I, can I throw you under the bus and then I'll throw myself just like two degrees worse? Is that okay? Just give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. I don't think she can hear me, so I think that's a thumbs up. Oh, thumbs up. Okay. Um, so my, my wife is notorious and men do not laugh or agree if this is your case too. Um, she's notorious for losing her phone. Um, I have found it in her back pocket before. Okay. Now, I'm much worse, okay, because generally when she needs her phone, it's not like um, it's an an, an urgent thing. Um, It's just like, oh, man, I I need it. I I need to text somebody. I need to call my mom. Um, It it has rarely happened that it's uh, super urgent. For me, I tend to lose my car keys and my wallet, but I don't lose them when it's not important. I lose them when I, I have an errand to run, a time-sensitive issue. It's like, I need to go out the door. I need to be someplace in 30 minutes, and it takes 31 minutes to get there. Where are my keys? Where, are, where is my wallet? Those are mine. I should know where they are. But yet I don't. Well, sometimes the same can happen with freedom. How do we know that we have it? Well, Paul's going to tell us there's a, a, a way in which in science, anyway, there's, there's, there's a litmus test that we can, we can use to determine uh, things analytically. Is there a litmus test to help us determine whether or not we truly have freedom? After all, we're all here. We're all believers. We say, yes, I have accepted 
the blood of Jesus Christ. I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But is there a litmus test to determine if we truly have freedom? I invite you to join me in the Epistle to the Galatians. The Epistle to the Galatians is filled. It overflows with this theme of freedom. Paul wants them to know that accepting Jesus brings them a level of freedom that they didn't have before. And it's mainly because they're dealing with, children, close your ears, um, this problem that they had called circumcision. They hadn't decided whether or not they wanted it um, or that they would continue to practice it and observe it. And so Paul, in his epistle, says, hey, look, freedom is important. And so let me explain to you what freedom is. Chapter 5, if you're in the epistle to the Galatians. Chapter 5. I still hear uh, pages flipping through. Galatians chapter 5. So he's telling the story. He tells the story of why this practice was set into place using this theme of freedom. And he begins chapter 5 saying the following. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We can reread this passage as, so that you may live in truth. That's why Christ has set you free. So that we can return one day to the realities of Eden. For that reason, Christ has set you free. But notice what he warns. Do not allow yourself to become enslaved do not accept the chains of slavery that come with the sinful nature. Don't do it. Because Christ has something better for you. In giving His life, He has allowed you to live truth. And then He gives the following message in verse 13. He says, Brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. You were called to live in truth. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. And later he explains what he means by do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. If you look a few verses later, in verse 19, Paul will say, don't use your freedom to be immoral, to be impure, to engage in idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, all those sound pretty reasonable. And then we get to the, no to the next one. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Rivalries. Dissensions. Divisions. Envy. Drunkenness. And the like. And he lists this, these for a very specific purpose. Because I don't know if you realize this, but oftentimes we, play, we place chains of bondage on other people. We can do that. We have the power to do that. For our words are often deadlier than a sharpened sword. The things that we say, the things that we do, can cause others to be in bondage. And so Paul warns, don't, the sign of true freedom is not objectifying people. The sign of true freedom is not using people with ulterior motives. True freedom does not cause you to see your fellow man, your fellow human, as an object to be played with. As an object to deceive, for if in doing so, we are reflecting the other father, the father of deception. But rather, verse 13 ends with, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly with love. So, G so what Paul is saying here is if you want to know that you are truly free, ask the question, have I asked people lately, can I help you? Now, as a teacher, I'm often paid to do that. That's not what Paul is saying. It's not, it's not an obligation it is not something that you are paid for. It is something that overflows from the heart because we have accepted the truth that Jesus makes us free. 
And so rather than using people, we act as Jesus would. For he is the said, I have, for he it was the one who said, I, I came not to this earth to be served, but to serve. So Paul says, if you want to test whether or not you are truly free, last week we looked at speaking the acts of Jesus to the people around us. Today, the other litmus test is, is your heart inclined to serve? Another way we can summarize that is when the Son truly sets you free, your hands are willing to serve. But how do we know that this is true? Again, maybe a case study would be something worth looking at. Somewhere where we can see that this actually happened. Someone who, whose life was transformed by Jesus. Someone in bondage who then turned around and served. you think we can find a story like that in Scripture? There are many, but I want to focus on one that we don't generally look at as a story of service. And so let's, take, let's turn, if you have your Bibles with you, to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, we see Paul once again. And Paul is doing what he's been called for. He's preaching the Word. He's, he's, he is a, a role model for, for the things that we were asked to do last week. To share Jesus wherever we go. And unfortunately for, well, fortunately and unfortunately for Paul, that gets him in a little bit of trouble. And we find Paul in Acts chapter 16, people don't like at this time, to hear about Jesus, so he's sent to prison. He and a compatriot named Silas. And so we find both of them in prison in verse 25. And the story goes as follows. At about midnight, having been imprisoned, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Yet again, an instance where it doesn't matter the situation, they're going to let people know about the God that they serve. They're imprisoned physically, but are their hearts imprisoned? Are their hearts enslaved? You would say, no. They're doing the very things that free people do. They're telling other people about the truth of Jesus Christ in song and prayer. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everybody's bonds were unfastened. A jailer's greatest nightmare. For you've probably heard this story time and time again. You know that the jailer's life was very short at this point. As soon as his superiors found out that the prisoners had, their doors had opened and they had probably left, because that's what prisoners desire, right? They desire to be free. His life was over. And so not surprisingly, when the jailer wakes up, when the jailer awoke, he saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and, wo and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Verse 29, And the jailer called for lights, and he rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell before he fell down before Paul and Silas. And here's where things get interesting. He brought them out, verse 30, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And we look at the story and we're like, well, that's, that's great. He was witness to Jesus Christ. But I would ask that you read this question a little bit differently. Given the situation that has just transpired, here are some prisoners who in their heart are not imprisoned. Here is a jailer who in his physical body is free. The question that the jailer asks is the following. Paul and Silas, you are prisoners but you have a freedom that I do not have. I realize that. In my incomplete 
being, I understand that you have a freedom that I do not. So Paul, Silas, what must I do to be free? And notice that the answer that Paul gives is one that resonates the language of John chapter 8. Sorry, I went a little bit ahead of myself there. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the truth. Believe in the, in the key that unlocks the shackles that make you a prisoner in your own life. Accept Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be free. But not just you. Because freedom is something that can't be held within. It is shared. And so Paul says, you want to be free? Accept Jesus. And you will have that freedom. Let truth enter into your life. And you'll be free. And everyone who experiences your freedom will also be free. And we generally end the story right there. That's where, that's where the sermon traditionally ends. But I invite you to see the reaction. The reaction of this jailer. For the following verses, verse 32 says, And they spoke the word of the Lord, uh, they wor the word, tongue tied a little, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. And notice what he does next. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. He served them. Then immediately, he and his household were baptized. But the service doesn't end there. For the following verse tells us, the jailer brought them to his house. He set a meal before them. And he was filled with the joy because he had believed in God. You see, someone whose life has been set free is inclined to service. This Philippian jailer, we don't know what his experience hearing about Jesus was, but in the moment where he recognizes that freedom is what he needed, and that is what his plea was, tell me what I can do to be free? His reaction to receiving freedom was acts of service. He took on the mantle not of a jailer with authority, but one of a servant. It almost, it almost reflects the, the acts of Jesus at communion where He says, I desire to wash your feet. And even though you do not desire it, that is my desire because I have come to serve. The Philippian jailer engages in service. Doesn't matter if he had authority, he becomes a servant. And then he engages in hospitality, which is yet again another form of service. He says, I have the honor of sharing a meal with you. Because after all, the one whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That freedom cannot be contained. That freedom is demonstrated not just in the words of sharing what Jesus has done for us, but in loving service. That is freedom. That is, that, that is the outcome of freedom. Accepting the work that Jesus has done transformed our lives so that we cannot contain not just the joy of the Lord, but the love for Him and the love for others. For there are two great commandments. Love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said it a different way. He said, love God, but then love one another as I have loved you. A sacrificial love. No longer was, was the litmus test for service or love the way that we love ourselves, which we know at times can be very hard to do, but rather the sacrifice that Jesus made, that is the litmus test for service. So what can we do now knowing what freedom is? and knowing what freedom ought to look like in our lives. The first question that I think we ought to ask is, have I been set free? And there are many indications in our life that that is the case. 
But one of the areas where I ask that, not just you are doing this in my own life, I have to ask this question, am I inclined to serve? Not out of obligation, but am I inclined to serve my fellow human? Am I inclined to serve? And that can be quite scary because oftentimes we look at the things that we have. We look at the things that we have, we look around us, we look in our homes and we're like, man, I I have lint. I don't have anything. I'm poor. I'm broken. What possibly could I give as a gift of service to the Lord? The story is told of an older woman who heard a message on Galatians chapter 5 and the need for service as a sign of freedom. She went through her home she came to the realization, I don't have, I can't find anything. What can I serve with? She opens one of her cupboards and she finds boxes upon boxes of tea. She's a tea drinker. She loves tea. She drink, she used, she, she drank, you know, herbal tea in the morning, herbal tea in the evening. When her family came over, offered them a cup of tea, she's like, you know what? I live, on, I live nearby a college campus. I'm sure there's some people who are lonely who would just like to get together for a cup of tea. And so on little index cards, she wrote, if you're lonely, desire some tea and some cookies, come to this address. Wrote the hours, wrote the address, posted them on all the boards around campus. And for the first couple days, she had a little table in her front porch, some cookies, some, some tea, and no one showed up. And she was getting ready to give up when one college student came through. And they said, we came for the tea. Is it all right if, if I sit down and, and just talk? She said, sure. And so this student began to tell her the their story, some of the difficulties, some of the classes she was taking, her, so the hard time of adjusting to college. She was from a different part of the country, so the weather was drastically different. She didn't know anybody, making, trying to make friends. The days went on, the weeks went on, and what started with one student became a full house. And she did this for many, many years until she encountered her rest in the Lord. Well, at the day of her, her funeral, honorary pallbearers showed up who had been students who had come into her house because she had offered tea. Eighty of them. Eight zero. You don't know the kind of change that you can make in someone's life with your small gift of service. All she saw in her hands was a sachet of tea, a cup, and a bit of warm water. But she made a lasting impact in her community. At the memorial, students would often say, I grew to love her as my own grandmother, as one of my own. And all she had was a cup of tea. What do you have that you can serve with? Have you been set free? Once again, there are many indications that that is the case. We are here as believers in Jesus. And we love to proclaim it. We are, in fact, free. But the litmus test, will we serve the way that Jesus served? One last shameless, shameless plug before we go. As many of you may know, we are, if you looked at your bulletin, there's a little insert with the first reading of the names for nominating committee. We're going to be selecting the new leaders of our church for the next two years. Some new, some will continue on. Last week, we looked at how church was a great place to practice speaking about the Jesus that we serve, the Jesus that we know, the Jesus that we love, the Jesus that has set us free. My appeal to you, if this is the place that we practice speaking Jesus, why not let this be the place that we practice service? 
Why not let this be the place that we demonstrate that we have truly been set free by Jesus? Where we can say, I I am not afraid to serve here because I know that the ones that are here are just like me. They don't have a whole lot to give, but they're going to serve. They're a whole lot like me. They're broken. They're not perfect, but I can serve alongside them as I grow in the Lord. Have you been set free? The one whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If your desire is to continue to find a way to serve the way that Jesus has asked us to serve, I'm going to ask that as I pray, you can do this really anonymously. Okay, As we pray, to say, Lord, I, I love You. You have set my heart free. Help me serve the way that You serve. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You because in the person of Jesus Christ we find freedom. And not just any freedom, but one that is definite. One that cannot be taken away. And You desire to show others what this freedom looks like. And You have placed us as ambassadors to help others taste that freedom. And so You call us to serve. You call us to bring the blessings that You give us and share them with others. Lord, we desire to be a church family that can proudly proclaim we have been set free. And our hearts are overflowing with love and a love that serves. Help us demonstrate our love and our freedom in the way that we serve, whether it be in this church, whether it be in our communities, whether it be at our schools, wherever we go, help us be servants of the King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have potluck this afternoon. We invite you to join us. And again, happy Sabbath. We hope, Lord willing, we see you again. Before we sing.